did Nike predict the inevitable golf club rat race that we have in 2022? Nike exploded into the golf scene in 1996 with its signing of Tiger Woods and then confirmed it was here to stay with its 2013 $200 million deal with Rory McIlroy. So it came as a shock, especially after some of their best releases of golf equipment in 2016, even with a new prototype driver that was coming out the year after, that they were pulling the plug on clubs, balls and bags. But did Nike know something about the golf industry that we didn't? And just like any industry, market leaders come and go. And if I was to ask the question in 2022, how many of you are playing with Wilsons, Rams, McGregors, Lynx, for example, it's probably not going to be as high percentage as it would have been 40 odd years ago. So we'll look at Nike's history and why they pulled out. The big question at the end of this video, who's going to be up for the chop? next now i was introduced to nike golf club in the era that i'd like to call yeah that'll do the percentage of people that just bought golf clubs off the shelf rather than having to test them and just basically went off branding color aesthetics and the people that are using them on tour was a lot higher than they are today and that's because the technology back then to try test compare accessibility x y and z just wasn't there therefore if you were plowing tons of money to be seen on tv adverts viral videos which nike were incredibly good at you're more than likely going to get that club into people's hands. The other huge aspect back in that era was pros sold golf clubs and making sure that pros were on your side was a big thing and Nike I remember, especially the reps, had a lot of leniency, had a lot of runway. They could give stuff away very easy so it's quite easy to sway pros, pro shops around the country. Not to mention margin was also very good on those kind of products. I thought it was a very aggressive tactic to get the golf clubs in people's hands and it's because they had a lot of catching up to do a Kushnet, Callaway, TaylorMade. These are companies that have been around for quite a few more years and had the R&D tech infrastructure team, you name it, already in place. Spending a lot of money very quickly was basically their only tactic. Now I'm hitting two drivers today, the Vapor Pro Fly as well as the Covert 2.0 and these were two of the best drivers that Nike have brought out. And it's no wonder they had to test the waters. They came out big brash, very much like their clothing, trainer, sportswear line. And nothing made this more apparent when we saw the SQ driver on the scene. And what you quickly realize with the golf community is that if you want the masses on your side, big brash, loud sounding equipment, which brings me on to my first point which Nike was probably starting to realize way back when especially as you look at their more conventional looking prototype that they were going to bring out in the years to come is that these companies are spending millions in tour bills advertisements R&D X Y and Z to essentially all build the same driver the same carbon driver the same dull sound the same ball distance because they're all limited the same amount of forgiveness because all drivers are limited and the same color scheme Mizuno is a great example blue 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 and now black 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 because you want it in people's hands and there's no point marketing spending all that money when you're only going to entice 20% of the market. And for me personally, when I look at Nike as a brand, they want to separate themselves from the rest. They want to be seen as the maverick, the trendsetter, especially when it comes to fashion. And that's all too apparent in all their Nike golf clothing over the last five, six years, pushing the boundaries of the golf community. And to be honest, I like the fact that that's happening. It just never was going to work with the golf clubs. Now, it'd be fair to assume that the reason that Nike quit all golf club manufacturing back and balls is because they had a 20 year loss of profits year on year not a single profitable year for 20 years since 1996 but again it does get me wondering and especially a company as large as Nike if you're really that concerned about the losses in the golf industry why would you make two new signings in 2016 and I read this great review that Nike was struggling to sign players because they didn't want to use the equipment not to say that it was bad but us golfers are very rare breed and that goes exactly the same for tour pros so if you've got tour pros that are winning making cuts in the top 20 in the top 10 they're going to be extremely unlikely to switch and jump ship even if there is a lot of money attached to it so therefore nike quickly realized that if they just stopped all manufacturing of golf clubs bags and balls they'd be able to 
have a lot more athletes on the roster, which means a lot more eyeballs on that Nike logo. And I think straight from the get-go, this was never a profitable venture, but it's a very good lucrative market to have a lost leader in as a company such as Nike. But still, with all this being said, it did come as a bit of a shock for Nike just to pull out of all manufacturing of golf goods in 2016. But 2016 was a pivotal year for drivers, extremely good drivers that came out that year. And not only that, we were starting to be able to measure how good these drivers were. And the best thing about the last six years is that the accessibility that amateur golfer, your everyday pro, any golf club has to this equipment that can measure club to club, iron to iron, hybrid to hybrid, is a lot more widespread than it was way back then. So you can only imagine how much marketing could sell a product back in 2010 compared to what it can do now. Second biggest competitive standpoint that we have now in 2022 compared to 2010 is the internet and information and how you can get an expert opinion or video or lesson, driver tip, you name it, on the internet compared to 12, 15 years ago. And this all culminates in one giant cost center for the manufacturers as they are spending more money, which we'll look in a minute, every year in R&D, development, X, Y, and Z, and with the ability that any amateur, any average Joe can go and test that equipment against their equipment from 2016, 2017. And because all of our swings are very variable, or very different, shall I say, I struggle to see those differences on a day-to-day -day basis when we're the variable and these drivers that have been spent millions on have only had marginal gains. And we'll look at Titleist and Callaway's revenue streams for over the last 10 years in a minute, but it goes to show how much these companies are spending on R&D. All the middlemen in the company, the engineers, the builders, the staff, the club fitters, you name it, it goes on and on. And I say there were launch monitors around that era, but they weren't anywhere near as good as the technology that was coming out around there. We're talking GC2, we're talking GC Quad, we're talking Trackman, and now we're getting raw data accurate data that allowed you to know what the club head speed to ball speed ratio is the launch the spin rate and all of a sudden people were gaining 20 30 yards on equipment and they're thinking yes these drivers are the best and this gets me thinking did nike predict all of this was about to happen because over the next six years we're in 2022 now we've seen zero difference with the restrictions that are fairly in place to all manufacturers, yet the costs are still climbing, especially through the year that we've had this year with gas prices and everything going up. The cost to make a new driver, to pay the staff, is going up. But the marginal gains, if there are any gains, are becoming harder and fewer to find year on year. And with every person like me and you having the internet, the collective data of one golf club to another golf club, and those marginal differences, especially with everything economically going on at the moment I wouldn't be that surprised if we see a major brand be acquired or potentially go out of business and before we look at the Callaway and the Kushnet revenue streams and profit and loss sheets which I saw online TaylorMade is the most interesting story from all of this because around the same era around the Nike story going out of business TaylorMade was somewhat on the ropes and got bought for just over 450 million dollars and it goes to show that potentially ball speed distance isn't always the winner when it comes to turning around a golf company. I think single-handedly the P790 iron has saved that business and it goes to show TaylorMade four years later has now been sold for 1.6 billion dollars to a South Korean company which goes to show with a bit of streamlining, marketing, advertisement, making a golf company profitable in 2022 definitely isn't impossible. But you look at some of the eye-watering numbers of the revenue streams of Akushna and Callaway, especially over the most recent years, Callaway 3 billion in revenue, but then only to profit $300 million. Now, I'm not an accountant, and I know there's a lot of things that go in and out in terms of investments and building the business, infrastructure, potentially making your losses here, cut your taxes there, and I'm sure there's a lot of you that'll be able to comment on this and show me why this is the case. But just as I hated for my bosses when I used to work for them in a shop, a driver would come in at 280 pounds to be sold at 399, and when you take that out of that, and the time, and the cost, and the demo ones the margin on golf equipment is so finite and after the biggest year of influx of golf players over the last 
two decades in 2021, 2020, it's staggering and shocking to me, even though the revenue stream was so high and so much equipment was sold, to have such little margin and with such uncertain times that we've got coming ahead. So with all that being said, it does make me wonder if Nike predicted where the golf club industry was going when marketing and hype wasn't necessarily going to be the biggest seller in the future when every golfer has the accessibility to a launch monitor and the internet and there's not necessarily so many smoke and mirrors. If you like this video guys, potentially you might like this one up here on the left hand side. Catch you guys later.